Well, good evening. I want to thank you for joining me for our Bible study today. As we look at Exodus chapter 32, I'm going to keep that up there. I was rightly uh, told the other week that sometimes people aren't sure what passage of Scripture I'm reading from. They know I'm in Exodus. However, I will try to make sure that you know exactly the chapter and verses that I'm working on so that you can open up your Bible and read with me. I encourage you to take the opportunity to do that. Let's, however, begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful this day for your many blessings and that you are with us. And I'm looking forward to the ending of this Bible study because the very beginning of it is a little bit difficult. So please challenge us and grow us in our relationship with you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to start with some of my statements, my beliefs, my faith, I should say, about God. And you might recoil at some of these words. Sometimes I think that God can be, you know, if we were to sit here in a group and I were to throw this out here, I think people would probably say, oh, I think God can be fantastic, beautiful, wonderful, gorgeous, whatever. I, <laughs> I think sometimes God can be a jerk. I'm just telling you. Yeah, you know, the roof didn't cave in on me. So trust me, I'm saying things that I really think about God sometimes. Sometimes. Sometimes God can be really confusing. It's crazy. Sometimes God can be really aggravating and frustrating. Okay? I just think, God, come on, you got to be kidding me. What in the world is going on? And I read the scripture or I feel like what's going on in my life. God, I am a... You know, I just get so frustrated sometimes. Sometimes I think God can be so obtuse, cryptic. You know, what in the world are you trying to tell us, God? Why don't you make it more clear? You know, this was kind of one of the frustrations of a member of our church who was an agnostic. He would come every Christmas and Easter because it was in his contract with his wife that he would come every Christmas and Easter, although he wouldn't come any other time. He came because he loved the music. However, he would always tell me, he was a lawyer, he actually said to me, you know, I just, the reason why I can't believe in God is because I think if there truly were a God, God would make it a little bit more abundantly clear. Now, if you are a truly Bible-believing Christian, God has made it clear. But, you know, if you're not a Christian, it certainly is not clear who God is or what God expects of us or wants of us. So I think we need to be a little less filled with that self-righteousness. These are truly things that I think about God sometimes. And I'm giving you permission because guess what? Many times the people of the Bible think that God is this way too. Moses certainly did. We're going to read one of those lessons tonight where God is, where Moses is thinking, that's really, God, you're so obtuse. You're such a jerk sometimes. In fact, there's a lesson. I don't know if we're going to get the opportunity to work. Moses actually says, God, I'm so done with you. Just kill me now. I'm so tired of dealing with this. This is how frustrated Moses gets. That's why I love the story about Moses so much. But tonight, we are going to take a look at what Moses thinks about God. And then what God does for Moses to help him. Moses is dealing with these very same frustrations that we sometimes, I sometimes deal with. God has tasked him with an impossible task, leading a stiff-necked people. In other words, hard-headed people. You know, I remember when I first came to this congregation, I heard these horror stories about how terrible the Slovaks were to their pastors. And those stories are horrendous at our church in Duquesne. I am told one time that the pastor came home only to find out that the church had cleared out the parsonage and all of his possessions were on the front lawn. I guess it was their kind of intention to tell him, hey, this is our sign. You got to move. We're tired of you. You're fired. Okay. I'm also told the same church, the police often had to be called 
to their congregational meetings because they would get violent. And there was one time they were screaming and yelling at the pastor so much. Women at those days would sit up in the balcony and there was, the men were down on the uh, floor screaming, yelling at the pastor. And the women started throwing hymn books at the pastor and the police had to come and be escorted out by the police. This was a typical occurrence. They are stiff-necked people. In our congregation, Holy Trinity, I'm told that during one of the congregational meetings, the pastor was so frustrated with the congregation, he collapsed at the altar and died of a heart attack. Spectacular stuff! This is what would happen oftentimes. So Moses is dealing with frustrating people, driving him crazy. And this is where the context of the story is. So let me read to you a portion of it. Moses said to the Lord, You say to me, God, bring these people up out of Egypt, but you yourself have not let me know what you will send me, that you will send with me, whom you will send with me. Moreover, you have said, I've known you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now therefore I pray, if I've truly found favor in your sight, let me know your ways that I may know you, so I may find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. Okay, we sometimes read this a little bit more kindly. Moses is angry with God. He is so fed up with God that God has stuck him with this turkey of a people. God, if you'd love me, just kill me now. He's mad. So you need to read it that way. You know, you keep telling me these things, God, but I don't see any evidence. What the heck? So as I said, Moses is dealing with stiff-necked people. He wants to know the plan. What's the plan, God? What is your plan? You keep, we're sitting out here, out in the wilderness, and all I get is complaint after complaint after complaint. We're hungry. We're thirsty. We don't have enough. When are we going to get there? I don't understand. What's happening, Moses? And I don't have an idea, and I'm tired of dealing with this, God, on your behalf, and you don't even let me know what your plan is. This is what Moses is complaining about. Do you understand why Moses is so angry with God right now? It is not an unreasonable request for Moses to want to know what the plan is. What's the plan, God? Tell me! <laughs> well, God answers him. Listen to this. So God said, My presence shall go with you, Moses. I will give you rest. Oh, thank God. Moses, well, let's stop with that in a minute. Come back. God is with us. God promises to give Moses his rest. But that's not exactly very satisfying. It is kind of devoid. Moses asked for the plan, and he got this generic... I'm with you. I'll coddle you. I'll comfort you. I still want to know the plan. It's devoid of any details, isn't it? Sounds good. I'm with you. I'm comforting you. I need to know the plan, God. Is there a plan? So Moses comes back to him. <laughs> so Moses said to God, If your presence does not favor in your sight... Yeah, oh, wait, I'm sorry. If your presence does not go with us, just stop leading us from here on out. How then can it be known that I found favor in your sight, I and your people? Because you have told us the plan. Is it not you're going with us so that we and I and your people may distinguish, be distinguished from all other people who are upon the face of the earth? God, you are not living up to your, our expectations of you. We saw that last week with the creation of the idol. You're not living up to our expectations, God. This is what Moses is saying. You are not living up to my expectations of what God should be. Wow. Moses is feeling really insecure, isn't he? He's saying, stop this insanity, God. Stop bothering leading us. Stop telling us that you're with us if you're not going to do something for us, if you're not going to show us a plan, if you're not truly going to reveal yourself to us. 
And this, by the way, is after God has brought them out of the land of Egypt. So even Moses is struggling at this point. He need you to be more clear. Oh. So the Lord said, I will do this, the thing of which you've spoken. For you have found favor in my sight. I have known you by name. So Moses said to him, verse 18, I pray that you will show me your glory. Reveal yourself to me in a way that is not obtuse, that is abundantly clear, because I'm putting my neck on the line for you, God, and you got to stop treating me this way. You need to hear that. This is what Moses is trying to tell God. <laughs> God said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name. Oh my goodness. Hear that again. I myself will make all my goodness pass before you. <gasps> that would be overwhelming. It would be awesome. You see, we are, we are, we're all from, we're all the show me state, aren't we? What state is that? Missouri, right? We're all Missouri. <laughs> we need to see it. We need to touch it if we are going to believe it. Moses is no different. Neither are any of the people of the Bible. They're like us. We're very predictable. God is not predictable. We are predictable. God knows this of us. We need to touch it, to see it, to feel it, to believe it. Show me, God. Show me. God is going to reveal all of his glory to Moses. This is kind of cool. God said, I myself will make my goodness path before you and will proclaim all my goodness path and proclaim the and proclaim the name of the Lord before you, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. See, <laughs> right there is an indication of the arbitrary and, in, 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 you know, our inability to understand how God is going to act. God is going to be gracious to whom God is going to be gracious. I will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. <laughs> God can seem very arbitrary to us. We want a pattern. We want to, to create a systematic theology where God makes all this sense. God doesn't make perfect sense because God transcends the universe. You think you're going to understand this, God? Give me a break. <laughs> God said, you will not see my face. For no one can see my face and live. Well, you know, okay, this actually sounds like kind of a lie if you've read, read the Bible. Because there are many cases in the Bible where people do see the face of God and survive. However, I think that God is limiting himself based upon Moses' beliefs. Do you remember how we said... That the Jews, in the beginning, probably Abraham, believed that God was one of many gods. But this God was their God. And then they believed, then they came to the belief that God was... The best God. Well, my God's better than your God. Yeah, my God might be one of many gods, but my God's the best God. But then they finally came, and this was probably the time of Moses. God was the best God of the gods, but God sure wasn't living up to it, and that's why Moses was kind of frustrated. But then, if you were here for our Sunday lessons, you notice something interesting about our Old Testament lesson, in particular for the book of Isaiah. He is very specific to say, there is only one God. There's a progressive nature to the revelation of God 
to the people of Israel. God was one of many gods, and our God is pretty okay. But if our God gets beat by some other God, like Baal, we'll kind of worship that one. Our God is the best God. Our God is the only God. There are no others. Do you see that progressive revelation that takes place in the, in the, in the Bible? Well, I think it's true here in, in, in the book of Exodus. You know, you can see all my goodness. No, before they didn't think they could see anything from God. You, I'll show you all my goodness. Not my face, because you're going to die. But then later, guess what? God is revealed in God's completeness and wholeness to many people, and not one of them die. <laughs> It's part of that ongoing revelation of God. But see, here's the thing that amazes me. God, oh, I want to write this down because I want this to burn in your brain. God wants to be known. by you, by us. If you notice, again, going back to this, I keep coming back to these things because it's important you understand how this whole thing is tying this the Bible into a bow here. Genesis 1, what happens? God does what? Resides amongst us. The seventh day of creation, by the way, is the most important day, not the first six. Day seven where God dwells amongst this world. It's the only God, by the way, that does this. Baal doesn't reside with his people. He's up in Mount Carmel, okay? Zeus doesn't reside with us. He's on Mount Olympus. These are all, by the way, contemporary gods to the God that the people of the Jews were, were proclaiming. This God dwells amongst us on this planet with us right here. Right here, Genesis 1 sets us off right off the bat. This is what God wants to do. God wants to be known by us. But we forget God. We wander away and we wonder, where is God? You know, it's, it's silly. It's, it's, like, it's like my dog. Sometimes I come home. Uh, <laughs> I, I sometimes come home from running an errand or whatever. And, the, and my little dog is behind me. And I'm turning around and she kind of follows behind me and she's, you know, I keep wandering like this, and she's always right here. And I'm like, where is she? She's sitting right here. She's on my heels. She's right back here. I don't see her because I keep walking away from her. We do the same thing to God. God never walks away from us. But we turn our back on God, and we wonder, where is God? God's always here. Always here. John 1, the Word of God, dwells amongst us, tabernacles amongst us. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and the Word of God tabernacled amongst us. Who's the Word of God? Oh, that's right, Jesus. Hey, show me state people. Show me. I got to touch it. I got to feel it. I got to believe it. There's Jesus. Huh. Man, it's awesome. God is finally revealed to Moses. Because Moses needs to touch him, to feel him, to see him, to believe in him, to have the security that while he's going to go through some difficult times, God has not abandoned him or forgotten him. Stop, run away. Stop running away. Turn around. He's right here. I've turned my back on God, so I don't see God. So I question, I doubt, I struggle, I wrestle. Here's what we learn. Three things. One, it is okay to question God. It's okay. It's okay to call God a jerk sometimes. <laughs> to be aggravated. To find God cryptic and obtuse. You're in a great line of faithful people who have gone before. Moses questioned God. 
Job questioned God. Abraham questioned God. Jeremiah questioned God. Isaiah questioned God. <laughs> okay? It's okay. You know, there are people who, I know, they mean well. Lay people who want to do my job for me. <laughs> and somebody will be struggling with, why did this happen to me? Why? And they said, and, and I'll have a lay person say, you should never question God. Well, you find that for me somewhere in the scripture because it isn't in there. The Bible is filled with questioning people who God considers faithful. It is okay to question God and wonder, why? Where are you? What's going on? Why are you being so obtuse? Why are you such a jerk right now? It's okay to say that to God. God's got broad children because God understands we're the show me state. We're Missouri. We need to touch it, to feel it, to believe it, and sometimes we doubt. It's okay. The second thing. Oh, this is awesome. God, I already said this, wants to be known. God wants to be known by you. God wants to embrace you, and God wants you to embrace him. That's spectacular. This is so unlike every other religion, especially that exists at the time of the Jews. Okay? And those religions, God was distant. Mesopotamia. Marduk, distant. Baal, distant on Mount Carmel. Zeus, distant. <laughs> Mount Olympus, you can't know the gods. They are indifferent to us. This God wants to be known and wants to be a part of our life. That is spectacular. This is, this is you know, we're reading a document that was probably written, not quite, but, but, but 2,500, almost 3,000 years ago. And they're talking about a God who wants to be known by you. At a time where most people believe that God was distant. Amazing. We're in a day and age now where people again think God is distant or non-existent. We have a message, don't we, Christians? God wants to be known by us. God wants to be known by you. That's spectacular. But three, God is always with us. Wow. Okay. It's like my dog. My dog follows me everywhere. Just persistent. You know, I, 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 I swear to you, I leave the house for two minutes and I come back in. You'd think I'd left the house for months because that dog just wants to be in my face all the time and with me. I, I missed you. I missed you. I missed you. I missed you. This is the type of relationship God wants with you. I know, I know. Some people joke about this, about, you know, if you're dys dyslexic, God, or dog. <laughs> There's got to be something to this that, that God has put some of himself in our dogs, right? To remind us of the persistence and the love that God has for us. I think there's some truth to that. Because God wants to always be with us and is always with us even though we don't always know it even though we might turn our back got us right there it's okay to question god god wants to be known by you god promises to always be with you let us pray Thank you, God, for the study that we lift up today, and hopefully it's an inspiration to people. We have a, an important message of God's love for the world, and we've not always been faithful. This world feels abandoned right now, and they question God. They doubt that God even exists. We need to do a better job of making God known. Because I think you adore this world. I think you adore every single person on this planet. So help us to be faithful. 
to lift up the God that we have had the privilege of knowing and revealing it to the world. For he asks this in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.